All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the second real lecture of 2020 and the first ever online real lectures. We hope everyone's ready for tonight's lecture. Get your favorite drink and snuggle up. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Tonight's guest is Matt Green from OMG Architects. After growing up in Hobart and stints in Kuala Lumpur and Dublin, Matt returned to Australia in 2015 and founded OMG Architects. Matt will be taking us through a lecture entitled Dispatches from the Coalface, Embedding Sustainable Practices at the Grassroots Level as part of this trimester's overarching theme of sustainability. Before we get started, as this is the second lecture back for 2020 and the first for many of our visitors tonight, we should explain who we are and why we do what we do. The Real Lectures are a group of free student organized industry lectures featuring practicing architects and industry professionals. The Real Lectures have been running at Deakin University for over 10 years. The series was established in a response to pursue engaging, relevant and thought provoking architectural discourse with those in the field and those studying. As students, we're aware of the surface level discussion of architecture that currently is prevalent in a lot of architectural media and certainly in the general public. Our aim with the curation of the real lecture series is to try and get to beyond the what and instead to investigate the why, delving into a deeper conversation about the built environment. You can stay up to date with us on Facebook and Instagram and on our blog. And if you'd like to see more of the real lectures, you can also see previously recorded lectures on our Facebook page and blog. All right, now without further ado, I'll hand over to Matt. Okay. Um, all right, great. <clears throat> well, uh, hello everyone. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, waffling on for the next hour. Um, hopefully, uh, Hopefully it won't go nowhere and uh, won't go around circles, but uh, I'll do my best. So uh, without uh, any further ado, I'll attempt to share my screen. I'll, uh, yeah, sorry, I'll get started. So it's very odd uh, being in a room, silent room by myself. I feel like I'm in space or something, but uh, never mind. Uh, okay, so... Um, as uh, Robbie explained, um, I am, a, a, I guess, a locally based architect. Uh, if uh, if you take Ocean Grove as uh, as being local to Geelong, um, and I guess this thing could be going anywhere in the universe. So, um, what is local, I guess? But um, but uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a, a, a an architect based uh, in Ocean Grove. I've been here for three years. Um, prior to that. Um, I was working in Melbourne uh, for a number of years, and uh, before that, I spent a decade in in Dublin. Um, some time before that in Kuala Lumpur, and before that, I was in Tassie, where I worked for a bit and studied architecture. Um, so, just uh, I'll just kick uh, straight into it then. Um, so, uh, the lecture is entitled um, uh, "From the Coalface." I think I can't even remember what it was called, but. Uh, um, uh, essentially what I want to talk about is, uh, is I guess, attitudes to sustainability, uh, since I've been practice, practicing, uh, I guess I've been practicing for over two, dec two decades now. I graduated in 97, um, and, uh, started working in Tassie for a couple of years, um, uh, sort of the back end of a recession, um, and then sort of, sort of decided to pack everything uh, onto a plane and go somewhere else and instead of coming up to Melbourne which most Tasmanians do um, I decided to go overseas so uh, I had friends that I'd studied with in um, uh, who were uh, from KL or from Malaysia um, I stopped off to see see them for a couple of weeks on my way to Dublin and ended up staying for two years where I worked uh, in, a, in an office uh, landscape and architecture office there uh, I then um, continued on to Dublin a couple of years later eventually uh, where I um, arrived right in the middle of the, uh, the Celtic tiger, um, um, a massive boom in the economy and particularly in construction. And I uh, had no trouble getting a job and uh, ended up staying there for 10 years. So anyway, to, to kick off, um, I mean, I, 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 I'm starting off with uh, this image because um, to 
in a lot of ways, this image sort of encapsulates um, some of the, uh, a lot of the issues that I think um, sustainability in the mainstream has in Australia, um, I guess globally, but particularly in Australia, Australia where resources are a, a key part of our, huge, huge part of our economy. Uh, coke and coal is the number one export. Uh, iron ore is the number two export. And I think uh, aluminium oxide is the third biggest export. So uh, resources are a crucial part of our economy. Um, so as a result, our politics is uh, uh, set up around a battleground, um, very much related to natural resources. Um, and that then, when it comes to the construction industry, obviously ties in um, fairly directly, um, both in terms of the attitudes and in terms of the development of technology or whatever. So um, just to kick off, um, hopefully this will work. Robbie, can you tell me if, oops. Can you see me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Go on. All right. So I've been, go away, Siri. So uh, I've introduced myself. That's me. Uh, I like puns and one-liners uh, and have a lot of T-shirts uh, related to that. So <clears throat> this is a T-shirt that was given, given to me uh, by my colleagues from the last office I worked in uh, when I left, uh, my uh, Mac Green T-shirt. Uh, this is the cubby house that I've been working in for the last um, four or five months. Uh, I happen to be in my office tonight, which is quite nice, um, only because the internet is a bit better. Um, but I've been working working in there for the last four or five months. Uh, I work uh, basically by myself. Um, well, that's not true. I um, have one uh, excellent assistant, uh, Drafty, uh, and everything else, uh, Adrian, who uh, works has been working re remotely for me for um, well, about three years now, I think. Uh, originally in Brunswick, which is now up in Canberra, studying architecture. So we've been uh, working remotely for quite some time. Uh, not always from the cubby, but uh, but, but it's a, a way of working that we've been quite used to. Uh, I otherwise um, do otherwise work effectively uh, by myself uh, in Ocean Grove, uh, uh, which is obviously a uh, tranquil coastal town um, on the Ballerine. Um, with uh, lots of beautiful waterways and uh, beaches, a great place to live, um, excellent connection to the natural environment. So you're never too far away from, from uh, reminding, uh, for a reminder of that. And, uh, and also a town with quite an interesting history. It was set up by the Methodists uh, in, at the turn of last century um, uh, as a, um, a uh, what, uh, what do we call it? Alcohol free uh, settlement. So um, it was, um, there are still there's still quite a lot of remnants from that, but um, yeah, it was a it was a fairly bustling um, coastal town, um, um, possibly not much more so than what it is now. And uh, and there's still a uh, covenant over the whole town, uh, preventing the sale of alcohol, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting remnant from those days. Anyway, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to work. Um, I do a lot of uh, work generally in Melbourne up until recently. Uh, and and some in Geelong, so um, and a bit around here as well. So, prim primarily uh, residential projects. Uh, so yeah, my practice uh, OMG uh, started as a joke, um, uh, and it kind of stuck. I started putting it on drawings, and then people started saying, "Yeah, that's I don't know if they liked it, whatever. Uh, it wasn't meant to stay, but it stuck." Um, and has developed into uh, yeah, people buying me t-shirts and uh, and <laughs> even this happened as well, uh, which also was meant to be a joke, but um also <clears throat> yeah happened. Um, the OMG thing was uh, kind of uh, came from um, uh, uh, other similar um, uh, irreverent uh, architectural pra practices like fat, for example big and uh it was kind of originally a piss take on um on uh oma um i uh, studying at uni and soon after i was a fairly big um super dutch fan uh firms like mdrv uh, mdrdv uh oma 
um, and uh, and Hertzbagger, I guess, um, were pretty big influences in my early days. Um, yeah, that's me and Rem. Uh, this is one of my prized possessions, which is a copy of Hertzberger's um, Lessons for Architecture Students, which I had him sign when I went to see him speak in Dublin um, about 15 years ago. And he apparently said that nobody had ever asked him to sign this page, which is quite a crucial image to me. It's quite an influential image to me. It says a lot about architecture, um, um, chance encounters, um, and I guess... Um, yeah, I, I guess along the, the lines of this lecture series, the reality of what um, built space or the the urban uh, urban condition is, I guess. <clears throat> uh, so that then leads me on to um, uh, this house, which is uh, I'm really only showing for another reason, which I'll lean on to in a second. But um, this is one of Renko Lass's, um original uh, first uh, large commissions as just Rem called us before he was OMA. Um, it's a house that I do find quite influential, but the main reason for, for referencing it. Robbie, can you, is that stopped? Yeah, it's just stuck on the, uh, uh, on the beach picture at the moment. Ah, shit, sorry. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is me wearing an OMG t-shirt. Apologies, everyone. I don't know how that happened. Can you see can you see a number plate now? Yeah, all good. Okay, apologies, guys. I don't, uh, uh, um, anyway, I'll try and recap there. <clears throat> um, so yeah, basically, um, uh, yeah, it's talking about Fat Big and uh, OMA, um, me, Ram, <coughs> and uh, Hertzberger and yeah, which is a uh, fairly influential image in my architectural uh, education and development. Uh, when I was studying at uh, Uni Taz, Hesburgh was a huge um, text and influence on us. Um, and uh, yeah, just um, uh, and uh, now, yeah, getting onto uh, Rem's house in uh, Bordeaux. So apologies for that, guys. So I was, don't know how those images weren't skipping through, but anyway. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the reason for ref referencing this is, I guess, um, to continue that sort of uh, theme of, re of reverence and uh, influence on where the OMG thing came from. Um, I, uh, living in Dublin, I used to go to uh, the Venice Biennale uh, every time it was on, every two years, and, uh, and subsequently, every time we go back, um, my wife is Irish, so we, we tend to go back a, a lot, and... Uh, um, Every time we uh, go back, I try and uh, time it so I can go to the Biennale again. And um, in the 2014 Biennale, uh, I was wa walking past the screen and just caught a glimpse of this uh, video um, uh, by uh, Ilo Bika and Louise Lemont, <laughs> uh, French names, very good at, uh, at those, and, um, and was uh, captivated by uh, this video, which... Um, uh, being, first of all, an old man, uh, cool house fan, um, uh, interested me. But um, with this video, uh, let's try this. Uh, cool house, house life um, is a 15 minute, minute film um, following the cleaning lady uh, of this house, uh, this Rem Cool House, uh, uh, iconic Rem Cool House project. Um, uh, basically just following her around the house. So um, basically the, the filmmakers followed her for two weeks and she just walks around cleaning, um, complaining about the house, uh, complaining about the architect and the owner, uh, bitching about them effectively. Uh, but um, to me and, and subsequently I found out these filmmakers have, have made 25 films and I'll show you a few more of them in a second. Um, uh, to me, uh, a kind of... Um, uh, um, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, to me... Um, it sort of summed up a lot of my feeling about architecture and and the idea of uh, 
uh, effectively what they try to do with these films. So they, they um, this is their first one. They they, film, uh, they followed the cleaning lady around this house and they basically tried to tell the uh, tell the story of the architecture uh, through real people uh, experiencing the architecture and and the architecture itself uh, is just uh, is just represented as as uh, fragments sort of in the background. Um, so it's kind of very much. Um, uh, an alternative to the sort of classic uh, magazine style way of presenting architecture. Um, and it's something that uh, I connect with a lot um, because I think at the end of the day, architecture um, is about the connection um, with the people that are using the buildings and occupying them uh, more than anything else. Um, in fact, the image, um, the, the uh, static photographic image is probably, um, you know, far, far from uh, the most important thing, um, you know, when it comes to, I guess, uh, thinking about how to um, formulate architecture. And um, so uh, that video sort of came from um, a, a tradition of, uh, of other sort of irreverent uh, representations of, of modernist architecture, like the Jacques Tetti films. Uh, and which uh, very much influenced um, these guys. I'm not going to continue that, but that's a bit of her walking around the building. Um, and then they've made a bunch of other films, including um, uh, following around the owner of this Sanab building in Japan. Um, and uh, following around children and this guy in a unicycle around the big um, uh, uh, infinity building in, um, in Copenhagen. Uh, but I'd hi highly recommend you um, checking them out. They're, all the videos are available online. But um, I guess along the lines of uh, keeping it real or the, the real lecture the uh, series, uh, to me, um, these videos of people experiencing the architecture celebrate the architecture um, uh, probably more than, than any other uh, sort of uh, traditional way of, of uh, representing architectural projects. <clears throat> Um, so, with the uh, Cool House House Life, which is a, a, a video, that, a film that um, influenced me and my OMA, uh, uh, yeah, my interest in OMA spurred OMG. It started as a joke, and now that's what it is. So, um, so anyway, getting back to uh, I guess the sustainability theme, that was kind of an attempt to um, talk about keeping it real. Um, um, so I, uh, I grew up in Tassie, uh, as Robbie was saying, um, uh, in, I grew up in T uh, Tassie in the early eighties and, uh, the big issue in Tasmania in the eighties was, um, or one of the big issues in Tasmania or the, the big, uh, battlegrounds was, uh, the, <clears throat> it was, a it was the fight for the, the Franklin Dam. Um, and I guess, um, I was 10 when this was happening and, um, it sort of forms my view on uh, a lot of things, politics certainly, um, but particularly um, our connection to, uh, sorry, the, uh, um, I guess, uh, the importance of protection of the natural environment. But um, the Franklin uh, River debate was, um, was preceded by the flooding of the, uh, uh, of Lake, Petter uh, in 72 when I was born, um, which was a uh, effectively an inland beach, uh, a, bit, a lake in the middle of Tasmanian wilderness that was uh, flooded to make the, um, uh, to yeah, create the uh, Gordon uh, hydroelectric power scheme. Uh, and that, that then led to, um, and then the, the Franklin River debate um, uh, it's, uh, came sort of ten years later. Um, uh, it, part part of the, the same hydroelectric scheme. So um, so that to me um, that that uh, that uh, uh, I guess um, uh, started the uh, the uh, Green Party in Tasmania, or didn't start it, but. Um, um, it's uh, it's it's uh, mobilised 
um, the Green Party in Tasmania, and um, and yeah, eventually led to Bob Bob being elected, and then Keating coming after that in the recession, and then Howard, and then me leaving Tasmania when that happened. But um, I guess um, the reason that I'm kind of uh, raising that is is uh, personally that um, that debate at that time um, uh, really kind of forged uh, a kind of set of values in me in terms of uh, conservation of, of the natural environment um, and it's something that I've kind of carried through um, one way or the other uh, until now. Uh, I guess the other thing I'd say is that um, Things haven't really changed that much in the in those twenty years, and so um, that's um, something that I kind of want to talk about as well. Yeah. So um, after the Franklin River debate in Tassie, um, that led that led to a, uh, I guess, a resurgence of connection to to the wilderness in Tassie that perhaps wasn't there. Um, and then. Uh, I guess that then raises the question now, I mean, that, that, that debate has kind of never gone away um, and that polit uh, uh, political background uh, about resources uh, and, and, and sustainability and, and, um, and clean energy um, is something that's, to me, you know, been fairly slow to change over those, over those years, certainly in the years that I've been in practice. Um, so much so that you know for those, those whole 20 years i mean this is a image of a uh, housing estate just up the road from me and uh, i think there's only one house there that has a set of pv panels on it um so yeah things have a slow to change uh, it's something that i find quite frustrating um but then at the same time uh, i'm constantly trying to think of ways that um we can bring sustainable ideas into the mainstream um in a way that's going to be sort of cons considered acceptable and not sort of alternative. <clears throat> um, so just to, um, yeah, I guess just to sort of sum up um, how I'm trying to uh, approach that in practice, um, I don't really want to be seen as a sustainable architect um, because I think you can kind of get uh, categorized and put into a box um, and, 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 uh, and I, and I do find that, um, you know, when retail clients sort of come to me, uh, sustainability is quite often a long way down the list of or clean energy or, 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 or green um, uh, initiatives uh, are fairly long way down the list of, of, um, of desirables. Um, and while I don't necessarily want to kind of um, define myself as a, as a sustainable architect, um, I am certainly interested in trying to push a, a, a um, clean energy agenda because at the end of the day, um, it's going to end up with a better product and it's just a matter of kind of convincing people um, uh, that it's the right way to go, I suppose. So um, just quickly, um, I know I'm talking to a lot of students here. Uh, these are three books that I would recommend. Um which I've kind of used for quite a long time. They're kind of good go-tos, particularly when it comes to uh, passive, um, as in uh, passive energy uh, uh, design. Um, the one on the left is a, is a government public publication, actually, but it's it's a it's an excellent um, uh, index, effectu effectively, uh, of sustainable ideas uh, all, all the way through from sort of passive energy to um, to embodied energy uh, all the way through to, I guess, mechanical systems or whatever. Uh, the one in the middle um, is a classic now. I think it's probably 20 years old, that house, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, book, but um, it's a great uh, go-to in terms of kind of a whole, whole life cycle um, uh, understanding of, of, of a uh, case study house. And then the one on the right is, is a European book that kind of you need to reverse a lot of the thinking but uh again another another good go-to three three books i'd really recommend <clears throat> and then the other one is um that i recommend that not a lot of people know about is uh um is the government's own uh, uh 
home sustainability website, which uh, has again great summaries and sort of go-to sort of basic basics on um, on uh, clean energy. Oh no, on sustainable design ideas uh, from materials to uh, mechanical to passive design and so on. And not only that, they have um, and don't tell too many clients this, but they have um, um, they have actually have house designs on there as well. Um, which are actually not too bad. Um, so yeah, again, if uh, sustainable design is something you're thinking of kind of uh, um, encompassing into your way of, uh, of designing and thinking about about things, then um, I definitely recommend going to check out this this website. Um, yeah, so they've got um, various. Uh, types of house, a two bed, a three bed, and a couple others, um, all for different um, uh, uh, climate, climatic, re uh, climatic uh, regions in Australia. And uh, yeah, um, not, not a bad set of drawings as well. <coughs> uh, so um, I've been waffling a bit there, but um, I'm just gonna try and uh, skip through a few projects um, of my own that I would, I guess, consider to be in the um, sustainable realm. Um, the first being a, a house in Yay, uh, which um, is, a, is a small two-bed house um, for a, a writer. It was originally a retreat. She's now going to live there. Um, uh, it was originally going to be a one-bed house, now a two-bed house as well. But it's in Yay, which is in uh, a, a zone seven climate zone, so cool temperate zone. Um, so pretty cold in the winter, pretty, uh, and it gets pretty warm in the summertime. So it's uh, up on the hill uh, behind Yay. <coughs> Yeah, here we go. Um, so yeah, a beautiful um, north-facing site. Couldn't be more perfect uh, when it comes to um, trying to design design a um, a low energy house. Uh, and a client very much interested in in low energy ideas as well. So um, um, so like I say, fairly modest house, but a, ha a house that nonetheless we've been now thinking about uh, modularizing and trying to. Um, trying to uh, provide a more efficient way of, um, uh, work out a efficient way of, of trying to modularize this. So two, two bedrooms, 8.2 uh, Nat, Natter's Nat uh, Green Star. Um, yeah, like I say, fairly modest um, size property or house, um, only 185 grand it costs, which um, is a pretty decent bargain. Um, but basically just simple um, um, ideas for, you know, standards, um, um, fairly standard installation ideas, but just a lot of them really, um, underfloor and slab edge heating, um, beefed up uh, ceiling heating, uh, expo an exposed concrete floor slab for uh, passive uh, uh, energy, uh, p uh, passive heat gain, uh, uh, projecting eave, uh, windows that are sized to make, sh uh, make the most and shade when they need to, uh, deep solar penetration during the winter time, Shading through the sun, uh, through the sun, uh, through the summer. Sorry, um, yeah. Design uh, window head and sill heights uh, designed to maximise um, uh, solar heat gain throughout the year, and, and uh, a um, yeah, and uh, a decent amount of shading off to the west to protect protect through the uh, through the summer months. Um, and uh, yeah, triple glazed PVC European windows. Uh, which didn't end up being most pretty windows, but they um, certainly do the job. Uh, and then enough room there for nine kilowatts of, uh, of PV, although because this client was only there by herself, she only ended up with, I think, eight panels. But um, And then uh, uh, um, grey water recycling and uh, rainwater capture. Um, yeah, and, yeah, a fairly uh, basic little house, but... Um, yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, talking to a builder at the moment. Uh, this is the house that was originally going to be uh, built in SIPs, but it didn't work out. We ended up just stick building it and just packing it full of insulation. Um, it was also going to be a passive, ha a passive house, uh, but again, um, the um, the client's budget sort of didn't stretch far enough to to be able to um, to be able to install some of the um, heat transfer systems and so on. But um, nonetheless, it's a house that's um, 
apparently only needs the heating on for half an hour a day in the middle of winter and in summertime she doesn't have aircon. So, um, yeah, it's anecdotally, and uh, this, this job's two years old now, anecdotally it's, um, it's, it's a project that's been fairly successful um, in terms of uh, being a very low energy house. And yeah, so we're just playing around with it at the moment with the idea of um, being able to perhaps um, uh, modularize this this and uh, and be able to uh, perhaps build it efficiently in a factory one way or the other um, and to provide a, a two bed and a three bed option. <clears throat> uh, okay, so the next next project is a um, house in Bo Morris, uh, the Deary House, which was uh, a mid-century modern house built in. Uh, 1956 um, had the same owner up until uh, 2000 and, uh, 2015, I think, or something like that. Um, uh, when my clients purchased purchased it and had um, the idea of um, basically trying to preserve it, but to try and turn it into a house suitable for their uh, family of three kids. Um, so, uh, well, I just talk through it really. This is a photograph from soon after it was built um, in 56. It was owner built. It was designed by Kevin Knight, uh, an architect who ended up doing quite a lot of uh, larger public buildings uh, in Bow Morrison Bayside. Um, this uh, is the renovated version of the front facade, which we retained. It was still in fairly good nick. We only required a bit of uh, painting and removal of uh, asbestos and and um, a re-roof, but um, but otherwise we we preserve the, the front facade. <clears throat> Pardon me, preserve the front entrance. It's a shot of the front, and then we added on this uh, 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 natural finished uh, timber clad box, or two boxes at the back. Um, so this is how we found it. Uh, this is the original house. Um, uh, the back south facing part of the house is fairly dilapidated after facing the the bay effectively for six decades it was it was in pretty bad nick so uh, we did pretty early on uh, realize that we were going to need to bite the bullet and pull the back of the house off so um, so um, unfortunately that's what we did but we tried to preserve as much of the original house as we could including quite a lot of the original timber floor which we tried to keep in place uh, so yeah we added um, added this box to the rear and extended the um, it, uh, extended a, a bedroom box um, to the back there as you can see and added a swimming pool obviously. <clears throat> we retained all the original trees. Um, this is a desert ash uh, that the original house is uh, centered around. Uh, we've uh, managed to retain that despite some fairly major issues with the roots but um, um, but uh, preserving the natural uh, sorry the uh, the original garden in the, in the house was something that's important to the client and, and to me. And it was from an um, energy point of view, it's, the trees ended up being quite good when it came to, to um, shading of the internal spaces as well. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of the idea is um, a an extension that was kind of uh, fairly blurred um, where the line between old and new was, was fairly blurred and it's kind of hard to sort of tell. Um, I did these sketches of a sort of 60s style um, to, uh, to try and get, uh, continue that theme. Um, so this is the original house. Um, and yeah, so that's the, we back, removed all those ancillary spaces at the back and, um, and, uh, and the original kitchen and some of the dining room there. <clears throat> and then we added on um, a new kitchen uh, living dining area, uh, um, uh, uh, introduced this uh, courtyard, uh, and the idea for, of that was uh, one one important criteria was the uh, the clients did not want it to be uh, it has to be air conditioned. Um, so natural ventilation was a kind of key criteria in the in the original planning and certainly in the sort of thinking through the design generally. Um, so all all. Um, the back rooms open into this into this courtyard, which is quite uh, well vegetated, um, and uh, effectively that's kind of um, a cool sink uh, in the summertime. 
uh, where air is sort of drawn out of the house and it works works very well it's um, uh, last summer time uh, last summer or the summer before the first summer that they lived in it um, yeah they um, basically said it was great and was cool all year round and um, in winter time it's extremely well insulated as well so um, yeah it's working fairly well um, climate wise <clears throat> It's just a single story extension, fairly modest, but a, a big enough to, to kind of um, accommodate a, a family, a modern family of three, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, so we've, we've certainly pulled, pulled apart the original house fairly extensively. Um, there's a lot of asbestos in the original house, uh, in the roof, in the roof sucking, uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's a remarkable how much stuff from that time and through those decades has asbestos in it. So um, we pulled all of that out, uh, out uh, retained all of the original Oregon uh, roof structure, um, retained as much of the original floor as we could um, and, yeah, introduced a, a steel skeleton to the new extension that's, that helps uh, effectively to hang the old house uh, off the new uh, so there, I'm sort of talking, when I say the idea is to tr try to blur old and new, um, that's kind of uh, the image on the left there is a, is a fairly uh, good example of uh, where I think we've done that fairly successfully, uh, having the old, the old house effectively framed um, uh, within within the new, project um, projecting into the new. <clears throat> And so that's the courtyard to the right there. Um, there's an image of the kitchen. Um, so yeah, the courtyards. Uh, 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 most most of the rooms are the back back open, right up into that courtyard. <clears throat> and then yeah, just sort of emphasising the connection to the to the established uh, trees on the site. Um, the other thing that I find quite remarkable about this site is that part of Bovronis is fairly busy, but it does have this um, fairly tranquil, I think maybe because of the original trees, um, it has it's still retained quite a tranquil um, uh, atmosphere in the house. It's, it's quite a peaceful house to hang out in, I guess. It's the, uh, the ensuite um, bathroom. Um, shower which opens up into the courtyard so you can see yeah and yeah we just retained um, as much as we could the original fireplace we reclad because there were issues it was falling apart um, and kind of beyond repair so um, it was it was reclad with uh, castle Mainstein. Castle Mainstein. <clears throat> but yeah ret effectively retained as much as we could there um i guess um as a example of uh you know sustainability or whatever um um you know there's only so much you can do with a with a, with an old house um but um certainly we um we did a lot of sun studies on this house to make sure that um that the heat load during the summertime was uh was okay and you know it's, it's worked fairly well that way um ventilation wise it works uh, very well it's very well insulated um and i guess we've kind of tried to pick up a lot of the the modern i guess modernist uh principles of um of uh of uh, of um heating and cooling um in the same way that we have in terms of the style of the house or the extension <clears throat> Okay, so um, uh, this is the next project, which is a uh, Māori Res house, uh, Māori Res building uh, in Brunswick. Um, this, is a, this is a job I started when I was working for Room 11. Um, uh, uh, and when I left Room 11, it was stuck in planning for a couple of years. And um, when, but when I finally got out of planning, um, the uh, clients uh, continued on and I documented helped document it so um so it's a job that started 
uh, in my old um, old days working for other people, and and became a job of of my uh, one of one of the first OMG projects. Um, so it's a concrete framed house, uh, concrete framed building, um, uh, five story apartment building, uh, very slender in a part of um, Brunswick where um, that is becoming uh, quite dense now. Um, there's another uh, JCB building to the right there now, and um, there are plans for, for a building to the other side, although that side is owned by council. Um, so hopefully I've got a video here that will hopefully work. Yeah, so this is a, this is a short descriptive um, video. That, um, Sorry guys, hopefully this is working. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, so um we'll get on to hopefully a short descriptive uh, set of diagrams. Yeah, so fairly very small site, very slender site, um uh with heritage issues, a, a 40 meter street setback from Sydney Road in Brunswick, um six or eight story um height limit. Um, very narrow site width uh, and uh, a precarious uh, piled foundation. Um, so a set of car stackers um, uh, for car parking and effectively an apartment uh, each end. Um, so precast uh, panel uh, frame um, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, a combination of operable and fixed solar shading. Um, so uh, the apartments at the front have got uh, a winter garden that faces uh, north that is that is shaded, and then the apartments uh, to the rear uh, uh, have this operable uh, solar shading because they uh, they're making the most of the uh, western um, view or the the um, that particular view aspect, but uh, obviously they were getting um they're risking getting um, blasted by western sun so uh, we have this operable system that opens and closes automatically um when the sun, you know as the sun comes around in the in the uh, summertime <clears throat> but a bunch of other initi initiatives i think there's uh, a 16 kv of solar on the roof uh recycled um Rainwater uh, servicing all of the toilets um, and uh, uh, low VOC. Um, I've lost, actually lost, <laughs> lost my notes on my screen. I had I, I had a list of the the initiatives there, but um, but a job that was uh, a client that was fairly interested in uh, pursuing um, <laughs> pursuing a sustainable. Um, sustainable initiatives uh in a in a small boutique uh mighty res project which is not always common uh quite refreshing um and certainly something i'd like to continue to pursue uh and then just a couple of other uh, little jobs here um this is another job in brunswick which is a just a small uh, house extension to a uh small uh modest victorian house um in charles street in brunswick and um, we got uh, managed to achieve 7.2 stars on this job we could have gone a bit further um uh, again cost is always an issue but again clients fantastic clients all my clients are fantastic these guys are particularly fantastic um one of them is currently working on trying to solve the coronavirus so he's even more fantastic but um uh yeah Clients really committed to the idea of uh, a clean energy solution, um, uh, not only for cost reasons, but just to be, um, just because that's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, the, a uh, a small uh, two, basically two bedroom 
uh, Victorian cottage with a with an old extension that we pulled the back off, uh, and then added um, uh, living areas and a, and a master bedroom suite to the rear. There was a there's a house to the north that was quite close to the boundary, so uh, it was it overshadowed quite a lot of the north of the site. So hence you don't see a lot of windows uh, along that along that uh, northern edge. But um, um, but yeah, opening up uh, opening out to a courtyard, so a lot of east facing and north facing shaded um, uh, glazing. Um, concrete slab floor, so uh, insulated uh, bottom and uh, uh, insulated under the slab and slab edge. Um, uh, beefed up uh, wall insulation and um, yeah, some like I say, uh, um, yeah, a concrete uh, slab with plenty of so, uh, winter solar access and um, plenty of shading in the summer time. <clears throat> It's a view from the sky. This job's um, kind of still under construction. Um, we built it to a certain point and they're going to finish up, finish the rest of it off, but that hasn't quite happened yet. But um, but they're getting there. Uh, they've also lived in this house for almost 12 months and reported last summer that it worked beautifully in the summertime. And they've uh, also reported that it's working very well in the wintertime. So, um, yeah, it doesn't take much to get a house, particularly in temperate uh, in, uh, temperate climate in Victoria uh, to get a house to not really need that much energy. Uh, really quite simple um, uh, uh, initiatives, you know, um, a bit of um, uh, thermal mass on the floor, um, good shading in summertime, good solar penetration in, in wintertime, um, plenty of uh, natural ventilation, plenty of insulation uh, and you know you can get a house that re requires very little additional uh, uh, mechanical heating and cooling uh, yeah, so just a few shots um, of construction yeah so it's just a, a raw slab with a um, the clear finish um, that, like I say, yeah, heats up really well. And then uh, just this little job, which is a one of my only jobs in Ocean Grove, but um, uh, a project where the client's quite keen to go effectively off grid. Um, I'm not sure he's going to get there, but um, uh, but he's committed to that as an idea. Um, which is admirable. Um, this, this is a small house that he's building in the back of his fa their family home. He's retired, and um, the kids are on their way moving out. And uh, so this is a they've subdivided their property and uh, building this small uh, house to the rear uh, of their ex existing property that um, that he's going to be building himself. Um, so yeah. Uh, Apologies, I've just taken the uh, planning drawings. I didn't manage to tidy these up for the presentation today. But um, but a house basically um, a horseshoe shaped plan, effectively, uh, pretty much north facing um, uh, a house located around a, a central open uh, terraced deck with a pergola. Um, again, maximising solar heat gain, winter solar heat gain, uh, eaves and pergola shading. Um, summer solar heat gain. Um, uh, all the downstairs rooms open up into this central courtyard and plenty of through ventilation generally. And then upstairs is a small, um, is a, yeah, just a, a two bedrooms and a retreat. Again, um, uh, well shaded um, to avoid um, summer heat gain and pretty much no windows facing to the west. Um, and windows that are facing to the west uh, downstairs are, are generally shaded. So again, we we do quite a lot of sun studies um, in a lot of these projects um, just to get an idea of how direct um, direct sunlight's going to work, uh, and to make sure um, solar heat gain isn't going to be a problem, and to mitigate it where it, when it isn't and uh, where it is. Sorry, and um, and you can't necessarily get a sense of ambient daylight, but um, but it's a good Kind of starting point, so um, that's certainly something we we spent a lot of time on this project uh, looking at. Um, yeah, and 
that's is, uh, kind of um, some of the modeling. So there's nine kilowatts PV um, with a battery. He should be able to uh, live off that uh, and support an electric car eventually. Um, um, he's keen to try and put more PV cells um, on there, but um, there's a great shared uh, solar um, PV panel scheme uh, that's just started up down here in Ocean Grove. So he's part of that. It's effectively um, yeah, help a whole bunch of local residents are, are trying to uh, get together and and uh, bring the cost down by sort of buying in bulk. So um, so he's this client's uh, taking advantage and and um, going to try and uh, create a, a small uh, power station basically. Um, so yeah, plenty of um, plenty of uh, uh, overhangs to to keep the sun out in the uh, summertime and and let it come in deep in the winter time. Plenty of cross ventilation, a fairly narrow plan. Um, um, yeah. Oops. Robbie, sorry. Have I, has that gone off? Uh, yes, yeah, your desktop wallpaper at the moment. Sorry. Well, yeah, I might I might just enter there. I don't know what's happened there, but um, I might stop the share. And uh, can you see me? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, well, good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess um, uh, I guess to summarise things, um, uh, I am uh, all but uh, I'm uh, you know basically just the standard small practitioner just trying to um, trying to do the best uh, when it comes to trying to um, promote and um, encourage sustainable options. Um, I'm in the process of getting uh, technically um, registered to actually be able to do this properly. I'm, I'm in the middle of a um, passive house course at the moment and a, and a NATO accreditation course. So um, something that I'd, I'd kind of encourage uh, anyone coming out of uni to to seriously consider doing pretty pretty soon because um yeah I think it's it's uh, uh, understanding the technicality of of how to achieve uh, low energy uh, buildings um, and like I say in a temperate Victoria uh, temperate climate like Victoria it's not that difficult to do um, um, but le learning the technicality of that um, you know, if you know, it's something that, that is that is um, worthwhile. It's something that when I finished university, I wish I had have um, uh, done pretty much uh, straight away. But um, but yeah, I guess it's never too late. So um, yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's uh, anyway. So that's probably it. Sorry, it's it is very hard talking without an audience. <laughs> No, you did really well. That was brilliant, Matt. Thank you so much. And it's hard, um, especially with no comments from the audience or just quietly talking <laughs> to your screen. You did really well. It was it was great to like get an overview of your background and um, kind of it was interesting, um, like touching on as you were growing up with all of the. Um, the yeah, that's something that's certainly influenced me when I when I think about. Um, my attitudes to all of this, um, it frustrates me that, you know, that the mainstream hasn't moved on sort of too much further from those days. And and that's, you know, quite a lot to do with the fact that there's this sort of like battleground around energy in Australia. And um, yeah, so you've got to kind of find ways around that. Um, there are certainly a lot of people out there that are interested in, in living in, uh, you know, low energy houses. Uh, um, you just got to find them and you've got to kind of just, Try to put the word out there as much as possible, and and um, and you know promote it as much as you can. Um, so touching on that, we have a question from the audience that I'm going to expand on as well. One from Kirsty. Um, she says, Matt, do you find your clients generally open to passive solutions, or do they require some persuasion? And I was going to ask as well, 
how far would you go to approve or disapprove a client based on their kind of brief? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of considerations when you uh, think about um, whether a client's the right fit or whatever, but um, I, I'm kind of moving more, more towards um, bringing uh, low energy up early in the conversation and getting a kind of feel for um, uh, their thoughts about that. So often, um it can be something that people haven't necessarily thought about. And I guess when they come to an architect, it's something that you can, um, I don't know, that you can, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly from my way of thinking anyway, it's, uh, it's something that, um, that you can introduce to the conversation. Um, fairly early on and, and often it's taken fairly well. It's, it, I mean, I am finding uh, more and more, uh, certainly with younger clients, I guess, particularly like um, um, it's something that is becoming um, a high priority in the mm -hmm. kind of wish list or whatever. Um, I mean, I don't really kind of, I, I don't really tend to turn clients away generally as, as a rule anyway, but um but I have no hesitation these days uh, to bring up, you know, the idea of uh, a sustainable outcome mm -hmm. uh, or a more sustainable outcome um, uh, and to try and kind of push that agenda sort of always. Um, I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, Matt, another question. Um, this one's mostly regarding the Sydney Road project, um, which used a lot less timber than your smaller scale houses. Yeah. Um, would you reconsider a project on this scale with regards to sustainability and its construction and not just during its use? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, um, uh, mass timber is now becoming um, a fairly viable option in Australia. Um, it's something that I've worked on projects before where that has been explored. I think we even explored it on that particular project. Um, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there's certainly um, plenty of, there's, there's plenty of way to go. There's plenty of other potential um, uh, uh, embodied energy related um, elements to that particular building uh, that could have been probably better explored. Uh, but, you know, yeah, come out, there are commercial considerations that um, sometimes just unfortunately um, uh, come before those. Um, so, yeah, we just try to kind of um, involve as, as many green technologies, particularly uh, as we could, uh, and to try and keep the build as efficient as possible as well. <clears throat> so touching on that, how um, – we've got a question from Matt asking – how are your clients talking about now the star ratings as their priority in the process? Or is it something that you kind of introduce into? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to be able to get to a point where um, where I'm only doing, you know, seven star or, or, or greater. Like, I mean, that, that's partially why I'm, uh, I've decided to do the NatWare's assessor course because I want to understand exactly how that system works. Uh, first rate isn't the, mo isn't the best it doesn't encompass everything, but it's a good start. And I think uh, between that and um, an understanding, uh, I guess, passive house uh, principles when it comes to uh, domestic projects, um, I think a combination of, uh, of the two of those, um, I think you can probably get to a point where you can almost design a pretty uh, low energy building without the client even barely even noticing. <laughs> um, you know, without it, um, without really affecting the budget uh, adversely or uh, or even being a thing, and that's kind of the ideal or the ultimate that I want to get to point. I want to get to where uh, I'm doing great architecture. This is just happens to be low energy, um, and that it just doesn't have the tag on it anymore uh, at all. And and that's ultimately, you know, I don't kind of 
I was saying before, I don't really want to necessarily market myself as a low energy uh, architect, you know, sort of that does low energy houses or whatever. Um, because at the end of the day, I just want to be an architect. And, you know, my, my view is everyone should be just doing, you know, there's no excuse not to, the technology is there to be able to, to do houses that are, you know, seven star and, and, and greater uh, on the NATO system. Um, you know, there's a lot, I mean, the other, the other thing is a lot of these systems are design based. Um, uh, then a lot, a lot of them aren't uh, construct and build based. So there's not a lot of, uh, in it, all these assessment systems, particularly the regulatory ones, um, there is, there's no, uh, there's, there's very little post occupancy or even post construction analysis of the building. So, um, the idea of air tightness, for example, uh, which is a massive um, element in passive house, house design and a massive um, uh, element in, in, in low energy housing, and particularly in our sort of climate, particularly. Uh, so uh, air tightness as well as, um, as cold bridging, which is, you know, just making sure that uh, the envelope is completely, um, that there are no uh, leaks uh, from a thermal point of view, uh, those those two considerations uh, alone, if you can kind of make sure those things are uh, well um, addressed, and that when I when I, I worked in Ireland for ten years, as I was saying, and uh, coal bridging is and Ireland, the UK, and other parts of Europe, um, coal bridging, so thermally broken windows, um, uh, window details where you know it's insulated all all the way around. There's no no uh, leaks for. Um, for uh, heat to get out, uh, and then air tightness are, are considerations that are that are just kind of general day to day regular reg, uh, regulated uh, issues um, that you kind of just deal with and 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 do. And and uh, certainly in Ireland uh, these days, um, door blower tests are I think mandatory or um, a requirement of any build, which is you know basically just pump air, close up all the windows. And doors pump air uh, into the door and then just measure how much heat, uh, heat loss there is. Oh, sorry, yeah, how much um, uh, leakage there is uh, through the building envelope. You know, those, those sort of things are, are com coming into the Australian market and you see it happening more and more. But um, but that sort of post-construction analysis is something that a lot of builders freak out about. You know, I mean, the standard, standard Australian house um, leaks a lot. Um, so... Uh, these are issues um, that I can appreciate why builders would be um, uh, freaking out about those sort of things. But, but you know, like it, it doesn't take much to kind of make sure these things um, are monitored through the build and, um, and yeah, if once it becomes part of sort of day-to-day -day practice, then those sort of things uh, just become second nature, and I, I saw that when as when I was in Ireland, um, air blow or air tightness. Uh, when I was you know, I was working on a lot of school projects when I when I worked in Ireland, and um, the air tightness um, in the regulations uh, came into the regulations um, during the time that I was working on those sort of projects, and you know a lot of builders freaked out about it for a couple of years, but eventually it just became a thing. So. Um, I, th I think there needs to be a lot more of that post-construction uh, analysis and um, and regulation of things uh, because you can design design a eight-star building or whatever, but unless you actually measure it, you don't actually know whether you know whether it's you know how it's actually performing. Um, you know, um, yeah, if it's not properly insulated all the way around or sealed all the way around. Uh, um, then you know it might not be performing at all, um, despite making a lot of effort to make to to try to get it to do, uh, to do that. So um, yeah, I think, and I, I you know a lot of builders that are sort of uh, in that sort of uh, uh, clean energy sort of d sustainable design um, build space would say that as well. That's kind of a key a key. Um, Key issue. A lot of builders, a lot of good builders, uh, would also um, reiterate. Just following on from that, um, while you're talking there, Josie posted a comment, uh, just in regards to the air tightness and testing that you're talking about. So she said, "But air tightness isn't a thing if you're in Brisbane, is it?" She says she sees it on the Gold Coast, oh, on Grand Designs for the Northern Hemisphere. 
but you want to encourage cool airflow having open windows and avoid using air fun, don't you? Yeah, so uh, I guess what you want is control is a is a control climate. So um, no matter what climate you're in, um, creating a airtight building um, uh, allows you to uh, to control what's going on. So um, just because you live in uh, you might live in North Queensland doesn't mean that you know your um, your uh, building wrap can have holes in it or or uh, you know not be taped properly or whatever or or um, you know, uh, it's, it's about being able to con control these things. So, um, you know, a building should be properly sealed. Uh, and if you need to cool it and open a window, you know, you shouldn't have to rely on holes in the building wrap to, to cool it, to cool the house. And that's a general principle, um, you know, when it comes to passive design, uh, generally, no matter what the climate is, you know, like creating a, a controlled, um, a controlled envelope uh, so that, you know, uh, if you're heating it, then you do that through heat transfer uh, ventilation, or if you're cooling it, you open the window. Um, okay. Um, there's another question here, Matt. Um, you recently shared a great Tom Kundig interview uh, where Tom was quite candid talking about practice and process, et cetera. Yeah. Is there anything that uh, that you've learned recently that you're trying to apply to your own practice? Um, and has your process changed much since starting your own practice? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I'd also, um, the Kundi Gidemi is a great one. I can't remember where I saw it or where I shared it, but um, um, I'm, as anyone on here that's an architect member would know, I'm a bit obsessed with the team forum and put a lot of shit up there but um uh but that was a great interview where uh, uh con tom kundig who you know i've seen interviewed a lot of times i follow his work um i'm a big jim olsen fan as well um you know a big kind of star architect um um that's right it was a i think a business of architecture um uh interview where he was effectively just talking about the kind of day-to-day -day workings of his architectural practice in a very candid way. Um, you know, I mean, he had no hesitation sort of talking about the fact that he was in it to make money, you know, that at the end of the day, he had 200 mouths to feed and that, you know, um, at the end of the day, he was, he was in practice to, to make money. Um, and, you know, which is quite, quite an interesting thing to hear from somebody like him. Um, uh, yeah, like, uh, I mean, I, I've been quite fortunate um uh over the time that i work for people uh, i worked for a good range of practices i i started in a very small practice in tassie for a year or two um when i first went to dublin i worked for a sort of local practice doing hospitals uh, my boss is the institute of the president of the institute of architects so sort of an architect's architect um I then went, um, and so I learned a lot about a sort of medium-sized firm. And this, for anyone that's sort of thinking about um, kind of plotting a career prior to to um, getting into their own practice, I would recommend trying um, vary um, the practices that you work for. You know, in the time that you're kind of learning the ropes or whatever. Um, so I went from a medium-sized practice in Dublin. I then went to a multinational. Um, practice doing a lot of public work um, where um, I became an associate that was running a team and all that sort of stuff. And then the GFC hit and things turned to shit. Um, I then came back to Australia. Part of me worked for uh, Rothiel Omen, a sort of um, fairly large commercial practice in, in uh, Melbourne for two years. And then, um, and then I started thinking about, about my own practice uh, about, um, you know, the thought about working for myself, which is something that um, I guess I hadn't really even probably thought about, but um, but I got to a stage and maybe an age um, where I started sort of thinking, you know, maybe I want to do this uh, for myself. I then went and worked for Room 11 for, worked with Room 11 for uh, three or four years. Um, and that was great. Um, it was uh, great to kind of get into a size of project um, that I kind of envisaged 
I would one day start my own practice doing. So, um, you know, that, that was a great working environment, working with some great people um, on some interesting projects uh, with some interesting clients. Um, and it's kind of formed uh, quite a lot of the basis for the way that I then went and set up my own practice uh, in terms of trying to achieve a, and a balance a balance between um, uh, you know good design outcomes and and uh, putting food on the table. So you know um, making sure I don't lose sight of the the business running side of things, and that's why something like that Kundig thing is quite refreshing to hear because um, yeah sometimes you do get caught up in the business running side of things um, especially especially when you're doing things uh, you know by yourself effectively um, you know it's, it's difficult to kind of put on your accounting hat and then sort of go away and think about sort of conceptual design ideas and then go and I don't know do some more invoicing or something it's um, it's hard to kind of get that balance right sometimes and um, I guess I've been doing this for three or four years now. So um, um, I am kind of getting used to it. I, I don't know if things have necessarily changed. I guess maybe as I get older or get more used to uh, running my own practice and um, less concerned about, you know, what happens if everything goes wrong or if I run out of clients, which I haven't found yet has happened. I one one thing that I find remarkable, and we used to find this in Room 11 quite remarkable as well, is that uh, you kind of get to a point, uh, some days you might be sitting around thinking, oh, you know, where are we going to go work next? And then suddenly just something, somebody rings up or something just pops up out of nowhere. It's It's been quite a remarkable run, to be honest. Uh, hopefully that will continue. But um, I guess after a few years of being in practice, uh, you kind of, a lot of your anxieties settle down about all of that sort of stuff. And um, it just, I mean, you know, you still got plenty of anxieties, <laughs> plenty of problems, but um, uh, I think that kind of, um, you know, am I going to run out of work sort of fear or what happens if I do sort of fear um, settles down a bit. I feel like that's kind of happened with me, which kind of then, um, you know, even, even in the last few months, um, work has actually been slowing down, but you know, I've kind of been thinking, okay, well, is this an opportunity to kind of change the direction of um, the sort of work I want to do and uh, the sort of space that I want to be um, working within? Um, and so I'm starting to think about, well, I'm certainly starting to think about the low energy thing. I mean, uh, yeah, I just, I've decided to, you know, go and do a bit of extra study just to kind of understand the technicality of a lot of this stuff. And, and I think that'll probably end up leading to, um, uh, a way, uh, trying to maybe direct my practice in in a way that uh, while I say I don't want to become known as a sort of st- sustainable architect, um, I do kind of want to kind of um, add that element to my everyday way of practicing <clears throat> and uh, understand the technicality of how you do that. So I'm going off to kind of learn um, how to do that, how, how to do those things. Um, so, um, yeah, in terms of wh- how my practice has changed, I mean, the other, the other thing that I would say is that I have uh, great contacts. I've got great builders that I work with. Um, and generally, you know, and I've, I have two or three builders that uh, I work with quite a bit, um, which is an invaluable thing. I mean, you know, um, having a builder that you kind of know that you have a good working relationship with, uh, takes a lot of the kind of fear and risk out of the process. Um, and so that makes it a bit sort of easier. Um, and those relationships are just continuing and I guess they're evolve. They are evolving. Um, uh, but, yeah, that's that's a really important thing that I've always tried to do is to develop a strong relationship with builders, which then often leads to more work. Um, you know, probably well over half the work that I do, well, easily, um, is work that I've secured through uh, 
builder contacts or uh, there are a few subbies even of builders, electricians and, um, and other sort of key subbies with some of the builders that I work with who also kind of get me, get me work and vice versa. So um, I guess the more I practice, the more of those sort of relationships are going to develop as well. Um, and as it turns out, quite a lot of those builders and a lot of those subbies are also into um, some of these themes that I've been talking about here, so, um, which is a great thing. So hopefully that'll kind of lead. In fact, one of my builders contacted me today and said, had I ever thought about doing a passive energy course, a uh, passive house course, because he just started one. And um, and I said, oh, yeah, as it turns out, yeah. So, um, you know, he's, he's probably a guy that um, the two of us might try and pursue more work in that sort of space a bit more so. it's heartening to hear that uh not only are you still feeling positive through this time that as you get more experienced all the nerves die down slightly it's a good thing to hear for us um, yeah as i think i've said uh i didn't explain before but i um you guys would know probably but i have been tutoring uh the doc um subject uh for the last couple of years and and i there's a few things that I tend to reiterate to students in, in tutorials, but um, one thing to forget, uh, to, to not forget <laughs> is that this is not rocket science. Um, there are a lot of uh, other pursuits that are a lot more complex than architecture and, um, you know, even documentation of buildings and good documentation and, and good uh, translation of kind of architectural ideas through documentation um, it can be quite intimidating when you first start doing it and certainly when you start uh, working in practice. And I, I certainly found that when I started working in practice. I mean, I feel sorry for the guy that I used to work with, work for when I first started, uh, came out of uni. I mean, who knows how many mistakes I'm, I made. I know a lot of mistakes that I did make, but there's probably plenty, plenty others that I, I uh, made as well. But, um, but, um, but, you know, like people expect, you know, that you're not going to know everything um and it's not that it's not that tricky like the un the idea of uh, weatherproofing um uh, insulating and and putting stuff together doing those things, sort of things properly and putting things together is not is probably nowhere near as uh, difficult and um intimidating as it as a lot of people um make out and um and kind of feel and like I you know I, I spent many many years being that way and you know you still do need to do st things still need to be done, done properly or whatever but um but once you know how to do how to document a building properly for example um um then yeah then you know it's it becomes sort of second nature and yeah I guess there's a lot of there's a big sort of hurdle once you, once you come out of uni once you get into practice of that sort of an intimidation, <laughs> uh, particularly in terms of the technicality of um, of construction or whatever. Um, but one piece of advice that I would always give people people is, um, you know, it, it, it is a complex process, but it's not that bad. And once you know how to do it, not that I'm saying that I do, but um, but um, you know, once you get confidence in that, then um, then you'll understand. You'll kind of look back and sort of think, oh, why did I freak out about you know, how big a box cutter should be or, you know, how far a flashing should project, project or something, you know. I'm definitely looking forward to um, getting to that level at some point in the, in the <laughs> far future. Um, yeah. So let's, uh, we're just going to wrap her up now a little bit. I'm going to ask the last question if that's all right. Um, sure. We've gone from Amy. This is her comment. She, she said, incredible references and designs, Matt. Um, and she asked, what are some of your ideas about changing the general attitudes of sustainability within the architectural community? And following on for that, how long do you think it will take for Australia to set different regulations prioritizing sustainability within new builds? And I think she's just touching on stuff like you mentioned earlier when you're talking about that label of like being a sustainable architect and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, like there is uh, fairly decent regulation, particularly in, um, uh, uh, in the commercial side of uh, deliver architectural delivery. And there's also, uh, you know, more, more of a culture, I think, 
from what I can tell um, in sort of pursuing these sort of things because, um, you know, there are more stakeholders or whatever, so there are more people to kind of think about it. Um, uh, I, I think to a certain extent, um, uh, there's only so far the regulation can go and that, um, you know, if we're going to kind of achieve outcomes where, where you where you for example where you where you would see a, where you just would no longer see a housing estate that doesn't have pv solar on every roof um like that's i think that's going to be market driven um i think there are better examples sort of globally of, of about how to sort of encourage that i mean just look at grand i always take grand design this is a good example um kevin mcleod always talks about sustainability always talks about using an architect whereas the australian one um peter you know they very rarely kind of even reference the architects and also rarely feature um, projects that are sustainability driven. Um, so I think there's still a long way uh, to go in terms of changing the sort of mainstream mindset for these things. I still think that um, in a lot of ways, sustainability is still sort of being a thing that greenies do and, you know, the mainstream doesn't. And um while that is changing, and I think um, uh, as, without trying to sound too old, but I, I do generally feel that um, the younger generations that are coming through, people that are buying houses now are seeing uh, climate change and sustainability uh, as being kind of crucial uh, decision-making, like crucial high priorities decision-making um, elements or whatever. So, um, yeah, like, like I say, I, I think there's only so far that, you know, regulations going to go to, uh, um, solving the problems because, you know, the market sort of needs to come along with that or whatever. Uh, people make, just need, need to make better choices. I've forgotten the other, uh, half of Amy's question. So she just asked about, yeah. Like general, I think you touched on it when you when you spoke about market driven things and how the younger generations are kind of bringing it into the forefront. But she, the other part of the question was um, your ideas about changing the general attitudes in in the future. Which so I think you touched on that. Yeah, um, I guess uh, you know leading by uh, example. Um, uh, Talking about uh, you know clean energy solutions had every opportunity. Uh, without sounding like a freak, <laughs> um, you know, just keep keeping it part of the conversation um, and uh, being kind of pure about it as well. Like, um, yeah, like I say, lead, leading uh, by example um, and um, just making it sort of part of the norm for, you know, how to, um, how to how to deliver a building, whatever. So, yeah, sure. Great. Okay. Well, I think that just about wraps things up for this week. Um, I'd like to thank Matt again for his time and joining us here in our second real lecture of the year. Um, next week we have a break, but we'll return on the twenty fifth to speak with Jeff Greenaway from Greenaway Architects. Uh, so make sure to set a reminder in your calendar or to tune in to us next week uh, for week three. From the whole real team, thanks to all of you who have joined us tonight and those who ask questions. Uh, we're really excited to be able to continue bringing the real lectures to your life. So see you next time. <laughs>